And I'm really, really pleased and excited to introduce Raya Hadsall, who's a director of robotics at DeepMind. Um, but Raya's very special because she's one of the people who used to do neural networks before it was cool. So <clears throat> she goes all the way back. She did her PhD at NYU with Jan, um, graduating in 2008, and then went on to be a research scientist um, at uh, CMU, uh, after which she joined SRI International. So that's CMU. She was there till 2009, um, and she was there till 2014. And then she came across to the UK and uh, joined DeepMind back in 2014. I guess she was in this sort of wave of people who had, who understood deep neural networks before it was known that that was a cool thing to do. Uh, to understand deep neural networks. Um, and I've had the great pleasure of uh, sharing the stage with Raya at uh, presenting at TEDx uh, in Exeter. Um, and she's a fantastic speaker with a wonderful tech. And also I think at um, a rework events in uh, London as well. Uh, she's great to speak to one-on-one, -on -one, but she's also a great presenter and is doing some really great research. So um, in uh, continual learning. And so I thought she would be a great person and she's kindly agreed to give the invited talk today. So over to you, uh, Raya. Thank you very much, Neil. I want to make it clear that I knew that neural networks were cool from the beginning. It's just, it took a while for everybody else to figure this out. <clears throat> um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, wish I could visit uh, Cambridge myself and be there in person, but this will have to do. Um, and uh, you know that everybody is probably looking forward to being back uh, in college in another, another few weeks, right? Next term is <clears throat> back to normalcy, hopefully. Um, all right, I, let me jump into it. I'm going to talk about continual learning in complex environments. So uh, although I lead the robotics team at DeepMind, I've been interested in the problem of continual learning for a long time, and it fits in very well with some of the fundamental problems of robotics. Um, so let's see here. Let me start out by saying the world is non-stationary, <clears throat> as you can see by my non-stationary GIF. Um, what do I mean by this? Um, well, <clears throat> the world changes, it changes quickly, it changes slowly, it cycles back again. Um, but you know, time only goes in one direction. So, um, and, and, and the world is very dynamic. And this is somewhat at odds with machine learning because when we build machine learning algorithms, we tend to assume that the problem domain is fixed um, and that we can capture all of the relevant variability in a static data set um, or in a fixed learning environment in the case of, for instance, RL problems. <clears throat> And while this is certainly true for if you're interested in doing well on M MNIST or ImageNet um, or learning to play uh, Atari well, uh, it's not true in the general sense. And so if we want to be ambitious, we want to think about how we can learn in non-stationary environments. Um, so, and as some uh, examples there, uh, in health, there might be uh, changing conditions, um, the changing state uh, or health of any single uh, patient in robotics. Um, the, the environment of the robot might change over time, as well as the robot itself might change because of <clears throat> changing friction in, in, in the gears or changing battery level, uh, for instance. Um, and even something like language, which we tend to treat as a large fixed data set, um, from a machine learning point of view, it changes, of course, over time. So a model that was trained on all of the language of the world in 2019 would now be at a bit of a loss when faced with uh, COVID, Zoom bombing, and, and all sorts of other fun things. Um, so where, where, where is the, the fundamental sort of disconnect here? Um, and I think that this is really based on, uh, on modern machine learning, so deep learning using large neural networks. And this is because deep learning is optimized for static, large-scale data sets. <clears throat> deep learning is powerful because a deep learning model can be fit to a large data set. And we have this very nice relationship there. It's very powerful. I would not want to take that uh, uh, away. Um, but let's 
let's think about what the implications of, of this are. So um, the deep learning is supported by large scale compute and end to end optimization. So we've got a nice ecosystem of compute and data set and model and optimization, and these work together well. Optimization is gradient based. Um, so variants of stochastic gradient descent have been used now for decades as the, <clears throat> as the method by which uh, models are trained. Um, but this assumes that the data set is balanced, shuffled, and randomly sampled during training, the IAD assumption. Um, and I will talk about this more later. The result uh, is that deep learning models are actually inefficient at learning and may suffer from catastrophic forgetting, interference, and other failure modes if they're trained in non-stationary settings. Um, I will point out, um, you know, not, not all machine learning needs to be motivated by how humans learn, but I think it's always worth thinking about how humans learn. Of course, we've been trained to uh, do well. We've evolved to do well in a non-stationary stationary world. So it would make sense that we don't need our inputs to be, um, to be IID, to be independently uh, sampled. Um, but you know, imagine if we did have to learn things um, from a shuffled, sampled uh, IID data set, then we would need to learn biology by sampling pages at random rather than learning subject by subject through a course. Um, can take it further. Imagine learning all of your subjects by sampling one page at random from all of your different textbooks. You could gather a page from Latin, a page from, from English, a page from geography, put it all together in a mini batch and learn on that. We wouldn't do very well. Humans do poorly when we learn in the same settings that are so critical for neural networks. All right, so um, we can think about what we can say, well, deep learning works differently. It's optimized differently. What's the big deal? Why do we need deep learning to learn sequentially, <clears throat> to learn in non-stationary environments? Well, like I said, there's, a, there's important applications. Um, at the end of the day, then people in machine learning do want that methods they develop go out and solve problems in the real world. So, um, and, an application that could continually adapt to change, to track a changing problem, um, it could specialize to a, a domain, for instance, language specialization, epidemiological models. Um, secondly, robots uh, and other systems could add skills over time and become more capable. They would be able to take advantage of things like curriculum learning and be able to uh, gain and improve over a whole life, lifetime. So it's how we think about lifelong learning. Um, we can go all the way to AGI, artificial general intelligence. Continual learning is considered to be a requisite to uh, achieve human level intelligence. And moreover, even if we're happy with sticking with data sets and fixed learning environments, then if we mastered continual learning, if we had methods that mastered continual learning, we might end up with dramatically more efficient deep learning methods if they learned a little bit more like humans would. All right, so let me start out by defining uh, continual learning. So the continual learning problem is relatively easy to state. Uh, we think about a learning environment that is non-stationary. Um, and we can think about that as being divided into a set of tasks that needed that need to be completed sequentially. Um, and there are a lot of variations within this. So the task transitions may be smooth or they may be discrete when we switch from one task one to task two to task three. Um, there may be very clear transitions um, at a fixed interval, or we may have variations in task length and whether or not they repeat or not. And there may be different types of tasks. So we're not just interested in um, supervised learning. We're not just interested in unsupervised learning and not just interested in reinforcement learning. 
think that tasks can be uh, of different sorts and we still see the same sorts of, of, of issues um, and challenges. And there may not be well-defined tasks at all. And uh, we can differentiate this from continual learning. In, in continual learning, we tend to think of also a sequence of tasks, but the sequence is controlled by the learner or by a teacher. Uh, continual learning solutions is a little bit more challenging because there are different uh, characteristics, there's different desiderata that you might want uh, from, this, from the solution, and they can be contradictory or they can be competing. So let me just run through the different desiderata, um, and then I can say how, how they might be contradictory. So first of all, minimum access to previous tasks. The model can't just store everything that it has ever experienced over time, um, and it can't interact with previously seen, seen tasks. Um, we have to maintain that this is a scalable process, so there should be minimal increase in the model capacity and the computation. Um, so we can't just keep on adding, adding new neural networks for each subsequent task. Um, although that does work pretty well, but doesn't scale in the long term. Uh, fast adaptation and recovery. We would like that the model would be capable of fast adaptation to new tasks or domain shifts and fast recovery if presented with previously, uh, previously seen tasks. Um, fourth, uh, minimizing catastrophic forgetting and interference. So we would like solutions where uh, training on new tasks shouldn't significantly reduce performance on previously learned tasks. So in this cartoon here, we can see um, what happens, um, how we perform on three tasks, task one, task two, task three, after we train on each of the three tasks in sequence. So I train on task well, and I do well on task well, high performance. Still haven't learned the other two tasks. When I learn task two, my performance on task one drops significantly. And when I learn task three, my performance on the previous tasks drops further. That would be uh, uh, the, the, the hallmark of catastrophic forgetting. And it's something that neural networks are especially prone to. Um, maintaining plasticity is in some ways the, the, the flip side of that. We want that the model should be able to keep on learning effectively as new tasks are observed. So in this case, we might see a failure to keep learning. Um, if you learn task one, but then have problems learning task two and task three. And this, this failure to maintain plasticity can happen because of regularization uh, of the model or a lack of model capacity. And six, this is my last in the laundry list of uh, things we want continual learning solutions uh, to do. Sixth is to maximize forwards and backwards transfer. And this is, is, is in some ways the most important, I would argue. So learning a task should improve performance on related tasks, both in the future and in the past, in terms of learning efficiency and performance. So when I execute um, task two here, this will allow me to do well immediately on task three, even though I haven't seen it and will potentially improve my performance, sorry, backwards transfer. That will potentially improve my performance on a task that I've already done without my experience. All right, so um, the challenge with continual learning is that some of these become competing objectives when optimized in a single model. So um, if we want to maintain perfect recall and forget nothing in a fixed capacity model, this becomes impossible if we have an arbitrarily long sequence of tasks. Um, Forwards and backwards transfer can be have to be a trade-off against the ability to also have perfect recall previous tasks. Um, all of these become a little bit more difficult as well in the space of having um, a reduced computational footprint, not being able to have infinite memory. These sorts of things. All right. Um, 
I'm not going to go too far into these, just worth noting that it's not quite as easy as just optimizing for this list. Next, I want to talk about go go to the heart of the matter and talk a little bit about uh, gradient based optimization and uh, what this uh, what the implications of this are for um, uh, learning dynamics and non stationary environments. So continual learning, um, I would argue, is a, a, a huge challenge for deep learning models in particular because of gradient-based optimization. So as I said a few slides back, gradient-based learning is effective, it's cheap, it is the method for training neural networks uh, for decades now. Um, however, there is a problem. Um, so let's think about what happens during gradient descent. Each trading sample produces a gradient for each parameter in the network. Um, that gradient is essentially a vote to make the parameter bigger or smaller. In a mini batch, in a mini batch of samples, then a gradient is produced by each sample in parallel and they're summed to decide the winning direction. The result of this is a tug of war over the direction of the change of each and every parameter in the model. So there's not a third direction. It's either that the parameter gets larger, the parameter gets smaller. Um, and it, so although there's differences in how much the, the change is, it essentially can only go in one of those two directions. Uh, so why is this important? Well, what it means is that in order for the parameters to reach an equilibrium and for learning to converge, then we actually have to um, be considering all of the different uh, all of the different samples at the same time. So that's why we assume that the data is independently and identically distributed. So if this is not uh, if the data is not IID, for instance, in a continual learning setting then catastrophic forgetting is that results. So the unopposed gradients in uh, task two in this case will cause the parameters to rapidly change. So as the, so we sample, we sample uh, uh, from, from our data set and we move smoothly to converge on a solution for task one in the first diagram here. And then if we change and we start to train on task two, then because we are no longer uh, uh, considering both of those um, tasks at the same time, then we're going to get this rapid change of the parameters. That's what catastrophic forgetting is in neural networks. This means that all of the tasks actually have to be present in expectation for learning to progress. So if we want to train on task one and task two and have it converge, to a solution that works for both uh, to solve both tasks, then um, we have to we have to sample from both tasks and learn on them learn on the samples at the same time. But this is really inefficient. So think about in an n-way tug of war, each parameter will only change in one direction, even though we we have all of these different uh, uh, competing forces tugging it in different directions. So we see this that in multitask learning then the rate of, of progress through the through the through learning tends to slow down significantly exponentially. Um, but maybe this is actually efficient. Um, if we are in a stationary learning domain and we're sampling our data IID, then maybe all of the parts of the data set are learned at the same speed. Um, and so it's actually not an efficient and inefficient progress process. It's just amortized over, over uh, the data set. But the answer is actually no. So what we find uh, empirically and theoretically, analytically, is that most examples in the data set are learned fast, and then multiple repetitions are needed to learn the remaining samples. However, the tug of war dynamics means that you have to have all of the samples present, even the easy ones, so that wastes computational resources. Um, so this has been uh, showed shown both in supervised learning settings uh, such as ImageNet. Um, and also this is uh, results from a study in RL that's been done. So in ImageNet, what we see 
is that even though the data is being sampled IID, that concepts, as in higher level features, are learned sequentially, even though they're all there at the same time. But they are learned one at a time, roughly. In RL, what we see is this sort of, um, is that even if all of the data is seen at the same time, we see these different plateaus occurring. And that's because the model is learning one task at a time, even though all the data is available. So even if tasks are equally complex and presented simultaneously, the model might still learn them sequentially, thus losing efficiency due to tug of war dynamics. So our argument is that even in if we are in a stationary learning setting, solving, coming up with a solution for continual learning could be uh, unleash unprecedented learning efficiency. Um, it's obviously feeling dramatic when I wrote that bullet point, but I do think that this is an important point, is that um, if we could learn ImageNet by stepping through one the data one class at a time, and learn a little bit more like a human would. Let me first learn about um, cars and then trucks and then motorcycles and then bicycles. Study each one. You would be able to learn much more efficiently, efficiently than trying to sample over all of the different classes at the same time, but still learning them one by one. All right, so the second uh, point that I wanted to make um, about continual learning is about maintaining plasticity. Um, and this is again a comment about challenges that we have in the learning dynamics of neural network training. So we tend to take, uh, we, we, we tend to have this illusion, especially now, I think, um, that neural networks are really well behaved. Uh, success is get guaranteed. You make a big model, you turn the crank, loss goes down, success is guaranteed. Right. We know theoretically, of course, that gradient based learning is local, and so it's possible to have bad local memory. But this doesn't seem to happen in practice. Right. And in fact, the solutions that are found by neural networks seem to generalize well. Um, so this gives us the illusion that, the, that neural networks are robust black boxes that are able to extract information from, from data uh, reliably, predictably, um, and relatively efficient, efficiently. Um, but, you know, if we look at this a little bit more closely, this should be a little bit suspicious. We should say, well, but this is a very nonlinear system, and we would expect there to sometimes be misbehaved learning. So it can't always be successful. And in fact, there's been some really interesting um, studies that have shown that there's actually a lot of dependence on the initial condition of the neural network um, and assumptions that we make of the training regime. So it's not that the neural network is just ready to learn and that um, any setting will allow it to learn. Well, there's actually been a lot of work that's been, that's been done in order to get neural networks to train well. Um, in particular, better initialization, larger models, better activation functions and architectures. Um, but, but, you know, make, you know, don't be surprised, bad local minima do certainly exist as well as very strangely shaped loss surfaces. Um, initialization is the thing that is vital to the final convergence of a network and to enabling the system to learn. So the little GIF here is a really uh, fun study that was done by my colleague at DeepMind, uh, Wojciech Cernecki. Um, and he said, well, what if I'm looking for particular features in a neural network? Can I find anything I want? And he was able to find a part of the lost surface that looks like a Christmas tree. <laughs> um, simply by saying, I'm going to imagine a Christmas tree and then I'm going to look for it in, a, in, a, uh, um, in the lost surface of an MNIST classifier uh, before training and it was there. So 
Uh, lost surfaces are strange things, and we don't necessarily want to just treat them as black boxes that we assume will work well. And one reason for this is that is when we think about what happens in a lifelong or continual learning system. So in a lifelong learning system, you're no longer controlling the initialization. If I want to be training on task 26 in a sequence, I am now limited by whatever happen has happened in tasks one, two, three, up through task 25. That gives me my starting point for learning on task 26. And if the neural network is no longer in a good state to learn, it's not going to learn well. So essentially what I'm saying here is that we don't have a lot of studies of what happens to the learning dynamics of neural networks at steady state after they've been learning for a while. Instead, we focus on what happens at initialization when they're highly plastic and what happens on conver at convergence. But in a lifelong learning system, we want to emphasize what happens during training throughout the steady state learning. And what we see is that in most cases, neural networks will lose plasticity, as in, they get harder and harder to train on new tasks. We tried this out by generating um, a few thousand, uh, a, a few thousand tasks. I think it was related to MNIST, and I'm forgetting what the details were. But we just generated some new tasks and fed them into a neural network, one after the other. And we were looking for catastrophic forgetting. We were wondering what would happen over the course of a thousand tasks. Um, and if there would still be the same rate of forgetting throughout this long sequence. What we found was actually that after a few hundred tasks, the network simply didn't learn the new ones anymore. And it wasn't that we were uh, over-regularizing, and it wasn't that the network had run out of capacity uh, because we were allowing it to just overwrite. Right? We were just fine-tuning it on every new task that came up. But it lost the ability to learn because it lost that state of the neural network that allows it to learn. Um, might be different ways to, to, uh, to, to, to make this work a little bit better. The interesting the thing that I want to convey is that it's something that we don't really know a lot about. Um, and that there are, we're lacking in studies, both empirical and analytical studies, um, of this aspect of, of the otherwise reliable black box. All right, um, I'm next going to talk a little bit about continual learning uh, solution spaces. Well, actually, you know, maybe I could stop for questions right now um, and see if there are any midway here. If there are none that I'm happy happy to go on, I can take questions at the end, but just in case. Questions? Yeah. I will I will go on then. Brilliant. Thanks, Ron. Not even sure where I would see. Oh, we've got one question. Um uh from you long. What did you mean by interference for non-stationary distributions? Uh, so interference um, is when we see that the, say the solution to two different tasks is, uh, con is contradictory. And so for, you know, classic example of this, um, think of two Atari games where in one case, I want to uh, catch a ball using a paddle, I can move back and forth. And in the other case, I want to avoid a ball that comes down because it's made of poison. So I want to avoid the ball. So the solutions to two different tasks are themselves different behaviors. One is catch, one is avoid. Um, and so what we would see is that if I just tried to naively train on both of these, then the two solutions would interfere with each other. Um, and especially if there is not a visual cue uh, to condition the policy, then you would end up with um, either oscillations um, or you know, various types of uh, manifestations of that interference. Brilliant. All right. Can you try? All right, continual learning solutions. 
So um, when we think about solutions, then um, uh, I think that one thing that's interesting is that uh, almost all of the continual learning approaches that we see are biologically inspired. Uh, and, and I think this is because in, in this case, humans are very good at non-stationary, at learning in non-stationary environments. And so we do tend to look at, at, uh, at biological solutions for, for inspiration. Um, the one that is less uh, biologically, well, that's not true. I think they're all biologically inspired. Uh, Gradient-based approaches is one space of solution. So really looking directly at what I pointed to as the source of part of the problem, looking at this tug of war phenomenon, trying to mitigate the effects of, the, of, of that tug of war um, um, uh, dynamic. Second is modular approaches. Um, and the third is memory-based approaches. And the fourth is modular. So gradient-based solutions, otherwise known as fixing the problem at the, at the source. This is just a little illustration um, of the general idea here. Um, so there's been quite a few different gradient-based solutions. A lot of them tend to identify, after training on task one, it would be nice if there was a way of identifying which parts of which parts of the architecture, which uh, neurons, which layers, which activations were most critical for solving that task, and then preserving those somehow when you go on to learn task two. That does two things. It preserves the knowledge um, that you have of task one, hopefully. And secondly, it gives you capacity to train up task two. And you can keep on doing this over time with each new task, you identify which are the key parameters to, uh, to fix, to reduce the plasticity of, and then you train using the remaining ones. So that would be the second bullet point here, elastic weight consolidation, which is work that I did uh, with my team at DeepMind um, a few years ago. Then that's exactly what, what that does, it uses the, um, um, the fissure in order to identify, uh, come up with an estimate of how important a given parameter is for the loss, and then regularize uh, those more heavily, so protecting them, uh, protecting them from, from, from changing as much. Synaptic intelligence was a, a paper that followed the same sort of approach. Um, another one is to directly uh, I've tried to align new gradients with old tasks. Um, for instance, this is the appro uh, approach of GEM gradient episodic memory. Um, and then learning without forgetting is, uh, is also a paper uh, from also from 2017 that uses distillation to, uh, to, to regularize and keep parameter drift from happening by uh, Maintaining, uh, maintaining the performance of the model on previously seen data as it, move, as it uh, trains on, before it trains on new data. The second area of solutions is in modularity and sparsity. So, and, and these may not seem like the same thing. When we think about modularity, we think about different, uh, different uh, parts, different partitions of an architecture, for instance, or an ensemble model would, would have modularity. But sparsity actually is a way to enforce modularity by decoupling uh, different parts of the network through enforcing either sparse activations um, or by using sparse gradients. And so modularity uh, gives, uh, offers a nice middle ground between a monolith monolithic architecture and an ensemble. You know, an ensemble might be a nice intuitive way to solve a, uh, for a sequence of tasks, but note that if you have a, 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 an ensemble with no sharing between the different parts uh, of the model, then you're never going to be able to build up shared representations shared features that can support rapid forward transfer. In general, then you're limiting the forward transfer of the model 
um, by giving yourself more uh, protection against catastrophic forgetting. So uh, maybe a cartoon of a, of a modular approach that tries to walk the line between still sharing, um, uh, sharing some component and having a hard partitioning would be something like this, where I can train um, on some base layers using task one, but then have a separated uh, you know, head of the architecture forward part of the architecture that's trained uniquely on task one. Then I can protect that and only train another part of the architecture on task two while sharing these base weights, perhaps protecting uh, critical features there through uh, gradient-based regularization. Um, or, uh, and then the same thing happens when we, when we add in task three. Note that this usually assumes though that we know what the task ident identity is because you need to use that identity in order to partition up your, your architecture. Um, so a, uh, one example is um, another example of modular approaches. So there's progressive neural networks, dynamically expandable nets, neurogenesis deep learning, reinforced continual learning. Um, and these all add on new capacity for new tasks as we see them, and they require you to know task boundaries. They also have the problem that obviously as capacity keeps on growing over time, then um, we, this, this, this violates one of the desiderata for a continual learning solution. So this means that in the space of infinite tasks, we're going to have an infinite architecture. Uh, which is not something that, uh, that works. At least not until we really solve scale up compute. <laughs> um, another set of solutions are similar in that they use architectural expansion, but they also rely on compression or pruning in order to allow for the, uh, for the approach to scale. So two examples of this, uh, one is progress and compress uh, from my team. Deep mind, and the other one is continual learning via neural pruning. Um, so I will leave you to uh, investigate any of these approaches on your own that seem like they might be might be more interesting. Um, and just a couple more uh, uh, approaches that are in the modularity uh, um, paradigm. So. One way is to start with a very large network and then partition that by channeling new task gradients to unused parts. So this is sort of taking advantage of the null space of the parameters of the network and using that for new tasks. Um, so Conceptors uses this approach and PathNet is a really interesting architecture from um, um, Fernando, uh, from Chrysantha Fernando that uses a large architecture and then uses uh, evolutionary algorithms to decide how to route different tasks through this architecture. Using different modules for different tasks means that uh, uh, different tasks can share the same module if they are similar, the same small part of the network, or they could branch out and use different parts. So it's just a different way of doing the uh, shared plus separate uh, architecture partitioning that we see up here in the cartoon, a little bit more flexible, a little bit more, um, more powerful. Um, so the, and then in, uh, like I mentioned, I think that sparsity is also an approach that has been found to work quite well for continual learning, even when that was not necessarily the intent of the, the authors of that method. Sparsity is often driven by an interest in, um, uh, in improving computational efficiency. Um, and, but it has been found that sparsity can be very valuable um, to limit the impact of learning updates in a non-stationary learning setting. So selfless sequential learning is an interesting paper that follows this approach. All right, moving on to memory-based solutions for continual learning. 
Uh, memory is, of course, a biologically inspired type of approach and quite natural. Um, so um, although you know humans uh, do not, we learn well in continual learning settings and we don't suffer too much from catastrophic forgetting. And that is because presumably we are supported by having a very sophisticated memory system, which allows us to store things that are important to replay previous episodes, um, sort of do episodic uh, replay, uh, as well as different, different types of things. Making this happen in a machine learning system is pretty challenging. Um, it should be, uh, it would be nice if it could be a magic bullet to solve continual learning, but it's not quite for multiple reasons. However, lots of potential there, lots of interesting things there. So when we think about uh, neural memory, neural network memory, um, what we're thinking about is some sort of read-write uh, memory that is controlled by the actual neural network rather than in a, controlled in a procedural way. Um, although in the simplest case, we can think about replay. So just saving a buffer of past experience, uh, a replay buffer can be quite effective. Uh, it just, in the, in the end, in the space of a lot of tasks, then it's not very efficient. Um, so replay is just saving a buffer of past experience. Uh, episodic memory is also doing inference on that past experience. And there are a few methods that specifically looked at continual learning uh, through this lens, for instance, catastrophic forgetting rehearsal and pseudo rehearsal, um, experience replay for continual learning, um, episodic memory and lifelong learning, and memory-based parameter adaptation. Um, Let's see here. Um, I think that so memory based parameter adaptation is a method where you uh, store experience in a compressed form. And then when you see something new, for instance, um, you're asked to do a math problem and you haven't seen that math problem in a few years, well, you can still go back into your memory, pull up your most recent information, and then literally do a little bit of local training on that. So it's similar uh, to approaches like uh, meta-learning that assume that you've got a little bit of space to do some number of, of local updates or some number of parameter updates on that current set of, of data that you have. So I've got a new problem. I reach back in, into my memory. I pull up just a few more examples of where I've seen this problem again. I adapt my parameters just a little bit based on that. And then I can do a better job of solving that problem. But it does assume that you can uh, continue to update um, update your parameters on the fly. Um, so, and, and this also still suffers from the problem, perhaps, of that it assumes that you have enough space that you can store all of your all of your experience. Um, a little bit more of a scalable approach is the idea of using exemplars or memory vectors, and thus having a more sparse memory. So instead of storing everything. I'm just going to store the things that are important. I'm just going to store some vectors that allow me some embeddings that allow me to uh, draw on some of that experience without saving it all explicitly. So um, iCarl uses this um, and this paper from Chaudhry just last year. Um, and even more biologically plausible, you know, in, in a biological system, there's no storing of any perfect information. Um, instead, uh, one might rely on generative models to, um, um, so instead of storing the actual data from an experience, you train a model and the model can give you back some of that data by generating, uh, generating new data. So deep generative replay and curl, continual unsupervised representation learning, both follow this approach and rely on training generators for different tasks in order to maintain performance on those tasks. So in general, memory-based solutions, like I said, they are powerful and yet they are com complex. So I think that there is a challenge there for how to uh, scale these. How do you train a system that uses um, an LSTM to write memories and an LSTM to read memories and then you know, another system how do you actually train that system um, 
especially if you're suffering from catastrophic forgetting as you go. So um, the, there's, I think that some of these systems uh, potentially could be could be streamlined and made more elegant uh, for continual learning uh, to work well. All right, and the last category that I will mention here is meta learning. So uh, I think that meta learning is quite exciting because in all of the previous approaches that I mentioned, use hand engineering to design the solution. We are hand engineering the memory architecture that's going to solve continual learning. We are hand engineering the use of the regularizer to improve, you know, to keep gradients um, uh, from, from, from catastrophic uh, forgetting, from overwriting. Or we are hand creating, hand engineering the modular architecture that is going to be the solution um, or the update rule. All of these are, you know, if, if, if we've learned anything from uh, a couple decades of deep learning, is that it's more powerful to rely on the data itself and to optimize for that. So meta learning gives us a way to learn the inductive bias rather than hand engineering for continual learning. So uh, I hear that you've recently had a lecture on uh, meta learning. So that's great because it is uh, can be a tricky concept to, uh, um, to start to think about. Um, the way I like to explain it is that you have an inner loop and an outer loop. And both of them are optimized using gradient descent usually. The inner loop is going to focus on coming up with solutions for specific tasks with usually a limited budget of parameter updates or the amount of data that's seen. And then the outer loop is going to op optimize over the entire uh, set of tasks for performance over everything. And so from the point of view of continual learning, let's see, um, for the point of continual learning, then the outer loop is going to optimize for performance on all of the tasks. The outer loop is saying, I want at the end of the day, after, after you know, running through 100 tasks, I want to be able to perform well on each and every one of them. The inner loop is going to optimize just for performance on each individual tasks. So that means that you put the two together, and ideally you have a process that's going to learn whatever um, architecture, update rule, et cetera, that's necessary in order to learn well on individual tasks and also maintain uh, performance across all tasks. So a couple, a few papers that have focused on meta learning for continual learning. Uh, first, we have warped gradient descent, um, uh, which um, I helped to work on and which has a, it's hidden in the appendix, but I think it's got an interesting um, approach for continual learning. Um, in that paper, there's deep online learning via meta learning, and there's learning to continually learn. Um, probably other papers as, as well. Um, as a final note on meta learning, I will say that there is no free lunch. So in this case, what it means is that um, is that if you want meta learning to perform well, you're not going to be constructing the architecture, the loss function, et cetera. What you're going to be doing, is understanding the requirements of the task distribution um, or the environment uh, where learning happens so that you get the right result. So there is still a lot of work for the researcher, the engineer to do, but it pushes it from being the space of the algorithm um, to being the space of the environment. Um, also, it's computationally demanding. So it can be uh, quite a difficult process to get significantly to get significant results uh, from meta learning, especially approaches like MAML are notoriously quite uh, computationally limited. However, positive, um, definitely a uh, potentially a powerful uh, approach for continuing learning. All right, that is the end of my slides. I just have a quick summary. Um, 
So I really think that continual learning is important as, mach as machine learning uh, matures as a field, then there are an increasing interest in how do we drive applications to solve important problems, and also how do we get to AGI. People like DeepMind talk a lot about uh, AGI, human level AGI. And uh, you know we want to we want to both solve problems in the real world and we also want to solve AGI. I think that continual learning is important to solve for both of those. Um, also important if we want, just want to think about more efficient deep learning architectures. We want to think about learning architectures that ideally could do as well as humans, but learn um, sequentially through the data available rather than always needing to batch. Uh, sample across across an entire data set. So there's a couple of challenges that I pointed to that are sort of uh, key deep learning challenges. Uh, one is the IID assumption. This uh, this the IID assumption exists because of tug of war learning dynamics um, that happen in gradient based optimization. And it's a fundamental source of learning inefficiency, as well as being the reason for catastrophic together. Um, another under-researched area is the behavior of neural networks as they learn at steady state, so steady state dynamics rather than initialization dynamics or convergence dynamics. And this understanding of what happens to a network um, inside the black box during learning is important to understand how we can go from task to task to task over a, a lifetime of experience. Um, and lots of different sort of avenues, I think, to look for solutions in. So I, I, the list of different papers and references that I gave in these slides is certainly not comprehensive, uh, but I hope it gives sort of a start in, in, in this direction. Um, I probably, one reference I could have put into, into the slides here is a paper that I wrote last year for trends in cognitive science that was um, where, where I discuss um, these these particular some of these different points um, in more detail. Uh, so I think that that is called embracing change, and it's in trends in cog side. Um, but uh, all right, that's my talk. I'm happy to take the last couple of minutes to answer some questions if there are any. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Raya. Um, that was really excellent. Um, see things coming in. Um, so already from Francesca, um, there's a question. Uh, I'll, I'll stop recording then people can feel free to unmute.